Hi, my name is Sharon Bird. I'm creating a podcast as part of my pre-service teacher training at the University of Victoria Summer Institute in Education. My inquiry is about examining Aboriginal curriculum development within the visual arts program of the BC Public Education Framework. The First Nations Aboriginal Arts Program in School District 61 is developed, supported, and funded by the Aboriginal Nations Education Division, which is located at the Victoria School Board Office. My inquiry looks at the potential benefits for the development of an Aboriginal Arts Grade 8 to 12 program that would be accepted as part of the core arts program. The following interview is with Ray Forsberg, a First Nations educator who teaches at one of the middle schools in the Victoria School District. Ray will provide some insight and a first-hand perspective about what's involved and he will tell us about the positive impacts of developing and implementing an Aboriginal arts curriculum within a public school environment. As a practicing teacher in the public school system, do you think incorporating BC First Nations arts and art traditions and philosophy into the BC visual arts curriculum, do you think it's important? I think it's highly important because, as I said, the enhancement agreement that we have, was they worked very hard to develop the four um, aspects of this, and part of it is including culture and art into the curriculum for every student across the board to raise the profile of Aboriginal nations in our schools to allow students of Aboriginal descent to gain more of a sense of place and belonging here, not just being a side project, be a focal point of the curriculum. Okay. Um, really important, I think. A lot of things that we try to do with our First Nation mm-hmm. kids is to make connections and to give them a sense of place and self-esteem. And when they see their art and their culture brought to the forefront, it helps them out. So how do you teach First Nations arts and art traditions and beliefs? I begin through some visual arts. Let's see. I'll just give you an example. When I begin my class, I do a PowerPoint presentation on the different aspects of Aboriginal art across North America. Then I break it down into specifics on Vancouver Island through Port Marwa, the Hwang art, Duchanov and Coast Salish art, and then go back historically and discuss what traditional First Nations art is and what contemporary First Nations art is and the difference between religious art and art for art's sake. I think it's really important to make those distinctions because if you don't, I think you really downplay the importance of Aboriginal art as a cultural base for us. That's something that's really important to the religious aspect of it. Then you have the contemporary art, which of course is fascinating in itself, and which allows more freedom and expression of the art instead of sticking to traditional forms. Right. What are some of the benefits you've observed from your students' learning and some of the personal growth that you've observed? One of the big components of the personal growth of the kids, I think, is just a But it builds within them a sense of pride, you know, when they've, they've accomplished something that they didn't think they were capable of and that they didn't really understand at first, but then they get the knowledge background and the artistic skills that go along with that. I have so many kids that are so eager to bring stuff home to their parents, they're done, you know, and that, I think, just to see the smiles on their faces and, and for them to share it with other students too. I often encourage within my class for my Aboriginal students to help others in the class. That really builds on their social skills. When students get engaged the first time in an art project, how do you see that, like enthusiasm, excitement, and engagement? Do you think it follows through to other parts of the curriculum? Oh, absolutely. I think when a lot of my kids come in and they sit down and they're intimidated by the art, they mm. find the, the skills, say painting or weaving or whatever it is we're doing, they find it intimidating because it's difficult and it's something that they haven't experienced before. So that there is a sense of anxiety with them. But as soon as they've sat down and they have enough guidance that they can learn how to do it, that confidence in them builds greatly, you know? And that's something that they can bring to other programs too, where they say, oh, this math looks intimidating. I don't think I can do this. But then, you know, you sit down and you get the proper instruction and then you know how to do it. And they carry that on. And a lot of what I do is teach kids how to teach others. In the art classes, that's important. It gives them the confidence. For a lot of my Aboriginal kids, they don't have the verbal abilities that are necessary to function in our society. You know, if they can write out a resume, great. But if you go to a job interview and you can't, you know, answer the questions properly in this job interview, 
you're not going to get very far. But if you can start speaking, and a huge part of our English curriculum now is oral speaking, right? I think that can be part of the oral tradition too, the Aboriginal oral tradition. And I think it's important that we talk through these things, that we are able to teach things. You know how important teaching is within First Nations culture, right? So yeah, I think that really does cross curricular. And you're saying you do like a lot of reading in your art class too? Yeah, I do uh, yeah, a lot of um, historical stuff, storytelling, political thing. Mm -hmm. I try to sort of get the whole picture of what Aboriginal art and culture is. You know, you, it can't just stand alone as art. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to be connected to our lives, our daily lives, you know, to our stories, our histories, our politics. Do you have any advice for educators creating First Nations art curriculum? Yes, I do. Approach one of the um, one of the artists and the experts in our district. We have very many of them. Um, they're always willing to help. They'll come into the schools. Um, some teachers are intimidated by trying to. They seem like they feel like they're co-opting Aboriginal culture mm -hmm. and symbols. Mm -hmm. But we encourage it mm -hmm. as long as it's sort of copyrighted territory that they're right. stepping on. You know. Um, but I encourage them. You know, take risks. Go out and do it. And it's important that they do, I think, you know. We have really have to start recognizing the importance of even art within our whole curriculum. And we need to recognize again that, you know, only 43% of our people graduate as compared to 76% of the non-Aboriginal population. There's a big gap there. There's a huge gap. What, are we, what steps are we taking to fix that gap? That's a good question. Where do BC First Nations get their capacity to carry on their traditions. Let's take a look at what's happening outside the public school system in terms of cultural preservation for BC First Nations. I'm sitting with Catherine Charles Weary, who is the arts coordinator for the First Peoples Heritage and Culture Council. Kathy, can you just tell me what the mandate of your program is? The First Peoples Heritage Language and Culture Council is a First Nation-directed crown corporation that's mandated to support First Nations and Aboriginal languages, arts and culture in the province of BC. And we do that through delivering funding and also other strategic initiatives. Can you tell me about the program that delivers the traditional skills in terms of cultural arts? The arts program that I'm responsible for delivers grants to individuals and organizations. And we have four streams of funding. One of them is specifically for sharing traditional arts across generations. In fact, that's the name of the program. And it's about three years old that program. We've always supported those kinds of projects but about three years ago with a bit of additional funding from BC Arts Council and the New Relationship Trust we were able to define a separate stream of support including separate guidelines and application forms and process and in the last three years it's gradually become the program that has the most demand on it. We get the most applications for that program, the demand for the largest amount of money, following through with that, that's where the majority of the money goes out to those kinds of projects. And the program supports all disciplines. So visual practices like weaving, carving, basket making, etc., music and dance. And then if there are other practices that I'm not including in that, they if they're traditional art practices and someone wants to help to transmit that knowledge and those skills across generations, then they can apply for support. And the grants are up to $12,000. So what is the role of the knowledge keepers in that program? Well, one of the reasons that we recognized that there was an urgency to supporting these kinds of practices is that much in the same way as with our languages, a lot of the knowledge keepers and the people who are fluent in the practices are elders. And of course, they're aging and they're leaving us. So there's a real urgency to supporting them in sharing what they know with the younger generations. Usually that's the way it goes. Once in a while, we'll see a project where there's maybe a person in their middle years who's learned something and then they'll teach both younger and even elders because sometimes our elders of course have had the things that they know kind of oppressed 
through legislation and through residential schools and racism, all those things will traumatize people into not even remembering what they know, but through learning and sitting with other people and working with the materials or hearing songs, seeing dances, memories will come back to people. Uh, so it's really powerful in terms of, you know, giving the elders what they deserve, that sort of peace of mind and supporting them and sharing what they know so that it can feel like the gift that it is instead of feeling like a burden of knowledge that they, you know, they, we don't want them to be afraid that it'll disappear with them because I think it feels like a really big responsibility to people. And these practices, those traditional art forms, a lot of the applications and a lot of the projects and the support go to smaller communities, remote communities away from the urban centers on the traditional lands because that's what those practices are connected to. So the traditional practices are much the same as our languages. The traditional practices, the artistic practices are connected to the land, whether it's through the materials that are required or in you know the designs that respond and represent the environment that the people live in and all those stories that are also attached to those places. And these are not found anywhere else on earth. So they're really precious and they're really unique to our identities. And so it's really important that we don't let those practices and the knowledge that's attached to those practices disappear. There's science involved and there's botany and there's mathematics, all of those different fields of study that are part of our cultures are parts of these practices and even the languages, the traditional languages. There's aspects of language that are only spoken when these practices take place. There's a lot of knowledge in the art practices that is precious and unique that really deserves to be supported so that it can remain vital and be carried on for future generations and for our own communities but also for society in general. There's gifts there for everyone when we are able to be our real selves. Now that we've heard two different perspectives on teaching and learning Aboriginal art traditions, we need to turn our attention to developing strategies that make a good fit within the schools and within the First Nations communities.